Shall we turn to the book of Hosea? The text was read by Brother Walter, so I'll not read the entirety of the chapter, nor shall I read verses 1 through 10. Hosea chapter 8. And we begin now a new chapter, which is precisely midway through our study in Hosea. We're halfway there. And the message today is titled Spiritual Schizophrenia, because the people of Israel, God's people, manifested in Hosea chapter 8 two different mindsets. And this is clearly seen here. And these two mindsets, these two outlooks, provide clues that help us understand this very severe judgment of God upon his people. The dictionary gives several definitions for schizophrenia, so I'm not a doctor. And I want to focus on the definition that serves our purpose in this study. Schizophrenia, then, is defined as a state characterized by the coexistence of contradictory or incompatible elements. The coexistence of contradictory or incompatible elements. And that is what was taking place in the perspective of the majority of the people of Israel. This is a problem that is frequently it frequently takes place in our individual lives and in local churches as well. The existence of incompatible and contrary mindsets. We all struggle with this. And I think this is the lesson that we learn in Hosea chapter 8 for today. Many problems come from this double-minded attitude, this phenomenon of battling mindsets. If not understood and dealt with, this schizophrenia poses a huge problem for you and me and for the local church. Let me give you a few reasons why. This double-mindedness is perennial. That is, it's existed as a problem from the beginning. It's pervasive. Every church, every individual believer struggles with it. It's an extremely important problem. We cannot avoid dealing with it. This problem can't be ignored if you care about your soul. Fourth, it's a subtle and deceptive one. Most church members don't understand that in the Christian life we battle with these two mindsets. There's this conflict constantly. And therefore they're given over to the worst outlook much of the time. Fifthly, it's a mindset or a problem that is overlooked and neglected. It's not readily identified or even understood by many Christians. And last, it's far-reaching in its effects. If you don't get a handle on this, if you don't understand this problem and get the remedy for it on a daily basis, it'll affect your life with the Lord, your relationship with the Lord, It'll affect the vitality and fruitfulness of the local church and your usefulness in the church. So, in Hosea chapters 8 through 10, looking at the larger context, the theme of judgment continues, very negative theme, but there are important lessons to be learned in the book of Hosea. But now in chapter 8, God is going to add more vivid metaphors and images in describing Israel's sin in precise detail, even though his own heart is grieved over their sin. So in the first place, we uh, schizophrenia rooted in apostasy. This schizophrenia takes place when we backslide, when we're far from the Lord, when we've reached the place 
of darkness in our understanding. So this schizophrenia has its roots in apostasy. If you are walking with the Lord and being renewed in the Spirit by the Word every day, you're not in a place of double-mindedness. You have one opinion, and that is God's opinion. What do I mean? Well, let's look at the text. We see in verse 1 of chapter 8, Set the trumpet to your mouth. God tells Hosea, he is to warn the people. So the first metaphor in our text, verses 1 through 10, is a trumpet, which again, as you'll remember from previous study in Hosea, is a symbol of warning. And so this is the second time God calls for the trumpet to be blown. He wants to warn the people. God is persevering with his people in mercy and in grace. He's warning them and warning them and warning them. The first time he used this metaphor is in chapter 5 and verse 8 when he said, Blow the ram's horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. According to Numbers 10, the Jews used trumpets to announce special occasions, to sound alarms, to gather the people for assemblies, and to proclaim war. When there was a significant event, whether it be of a religious or of a hostile nature, trumpets were sounded. When God wanted to warn the nation or large areas, large groups of people, he sent trumpets, he sent ram's horns into the area to warn the people. This particular trumpet call in verse 1 was that of an alarm because the enemy was coming and God was giving his people yet another opportunity to repent. The second warning of severe judgment again shows the mercy of God. The, excuse me. The Jews it was the shofar horn, which had a very distinct sound. You can understand from a long distance what that horn meant. Usually the shofar horn was blown as a call to worship and prayer went out to the people of God. And so when they heard that particular horn, they knew they were to come to worship and the assembly was gathering to bring their offerings to the Lord in worship. But God didn't have to warn them again. They don't deserve another chance. And God warns them, like I said, while he's deeply hurt and grieved because of their rebellion, which points to the mercy of God. Normally, uh, not normally, but sometimes as parents, when we discipline our children, it's out of anger. And that's not the way we want to discipline them. Um, God is grieved, he could pour out judgment on them, but he has to hold back his hand of judgment while he extends his overture of mercy. And so we read in scripture then, in James 2.13, that mercy triumphs over judgment. And this is the case because we see in God's nature, in his being, he delights to show mercy. He prefers to show kindness rather than judge. As we read in Ezekiel 33, 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And the scripture extols the mercy and grace of God in this particular sense that when we deserve punishment, God prefers to show kindness and compassion. For example, in Micah 7, 18 and following, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He's referring to his own people. He does not return, retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. So we see the driving desire in, in, in terms of God's relationship with his people is to have mercy dominate the relational landscape in his communion with his people. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, we read, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So again, we have been the recipi recipients of mercy. If you're a Christian today, you have been the constant receiver of the grace and mercy of God. If we sat down and wrote a book or had the, kept a journal about all the times that we deserved punishment and chastisement, but instead received grace and mercy, we would fall on our face and worship the Lord and weep tears of love and praise to Him because He constantly replaces punishment with kindness and mercy and patience towards us. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we should indeed praise God, and that's why we're here, to worship and to adore and to bless the Lord through the teaching and preaching of His Word that might stimulate and prompt our hearts to bring our offerings of adoration and praise before Him. But then continuing in verse 1, it says, He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord. The second metaphor God uses is that of an eagle, which is a fearsome bird of great strength and power. Who of us does not fear the eagle, the symbol of might, which many nations, renowned nations like Rome, like Germany under Hitler, like the United States of America, uses the, the eagle to symbolize the great strength and power of the nation. And so what a fearful statement here then, where we read that God will come against the house of the Lord. The figure of an eagle is that of God coming with great punishing strength, chastising might against his own house, which affirms that God is not happy with the externals in religion. If the people disobey, if the people do not have their hearts in the right place, he doesn't care what we do on the outside. He doesn't receive our worship. He doesn't acknowledge the ceremonies and rituals that we mouth to him when our hearts are not in the right place. If Christianity were reduced to just attending church or going through the motions, paying lip service to creeds and confined to symbols and rituals, there's no difference between this and what the Jews were going through here in the book of Hosea. They've reached that place where God's own house became a stench to him because there was little or no spiritual life in their worship, in their service, in their relationship with God. You see, God is concerned with our hearts, not at the outward appearance. This is a major principle running throughout the entire Bible. And this principle of God focusing on the inner man, not necessarily the outer man, God says, rend your hearts and not your garments, is a major theme in the book of Hosea. And because the Jews were all about the externals and ceremonies with no love for God and no holiness of life, the Assyrian eagle was about to swoop down and destroy the very house of the Lord, which refers to the nation of Israel. For the people were called God's dwelling place, which was symbolized by the temple itself. Continuing verse 1, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. God reiterates the reason why he's judging his people. Indifference to the covenant. They have transgressed my covenant, he said. And rejection of God's law. That's why he's judging his people. But their rejection of the covenant and the word of God only reveals the condition of their heart. A believer who truly loves God, who has a clear conscience and a pure heart and is walking in love with the Lord, loves the law of God, loves the word of God, loves the covenant that God made with his people. 
the covenant of grace, the covenant of holiness. And so this, this attitude of the Jews that God reveals, they rejected His covenant and His law, shows us how self-centered they are, not God-centered. They're into themselves. If God was on the throne of their hearts, it would be seen in their esteem of the covenant and the law. It would be expressed in their affections and in their priorities. Now verse 2, Israel will cry to me, my God, we know you. We know you. Now this is a pivotal text and the entire chapter hinges upon it. It provides the critical clue to understanding the dynamic that's going on here under the surface and behind the scenes. It reveals what's going on in Israel's heart and mind. It gives us a picture, a very important picture of where you and I don't want to go to. It's like, it's like a break that enables us when we find ourselves slipping away into this same kind of mentality uh, it, that exists in Israel that we need to put the brakes on and say something's wrong, something's going in the wrong direction with me. I don't want to end up having the same kind of schizophrenia that Israel has. So let me break it down for you, what's going wrong with Israel, based on Israel's statement here to God. Now, at the end of verse 1, God assesses Israel's moral condition and tells them the reason for their punishment, as we already saw. They've transgressed the covenant, they've rebelled against the law. Tells them the reason. Now, in verse 2, God anticipates Israel's response to the reason God gave for their judgment. And what does God say is going on in Israel's heart and what their response would be to God? God, we know you. We're your children. How can you say we've transgressed the covenant and we've rejected your law? We, we know you. But what's going on here? Is this the correct answer? No, this is not the correct response Israel should have. What they're, duty, what they're doing is, is that this response diverts attention from the present issue. They don't address their present moral misbehavior that God brings up in his statement of them rejecting the law and rebelling against the covenant. They completely dismiss that. They sidestep it. And they go back to the beginning. They go back to their inception as a nation. God, you called us to be your people. We know you. We're your people. You're, we worship you, the true God. We love you. We know you. Let me give you an example of this in the Bible. An example of someone that does the same exact thing, sidestepping the real issue. And we do this, you and I, do this all the time when we try to justify ourselves in our sin, in our misbehavior, or in not obeying all the commandments of God, like Israel was doing. We do the same thing. But Adam is an example of changing the subject to avoid accountability. This is kind of what takes place in an ad hominem attack. Someone brings up an issue, focuses calmly on the issue, and the person who's hearing it attacks the person, attacks the messenger, rather than addressing the issue. It's kind of like an ad hominem attack, but not exactly. But Adam is an example of changing the subject to avoid culpability. For example, I'll read it to you, you don't have to turn there. In Genesis 3, 9 through 12, we read, Then the Lord God called Adam, and said to him, where are you? This is after the fall. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. I'm resisting temptation to go down a rabbit trail on this and make some quick applications to wives or women in general, but I'll not do it. I, I, I promised myself I need to reduce the amount of time I preach, uh, so I'm going to move on. 
What happened? Well, Adam failed to take personal responsibility for his sin. Obviously, we are all familiar with the story. How? Well, he changed the subject by prevaricating. Prevaricating means deliberately misleading, deflecting, misstating, and creating a wrong impression. In other words, Adam changed the subject. He prevaricated deliberately. Adam rejected both God's evaluation of his behavior and his personal accountability by changing the subject. Israel rejected both God's evaluation and their accountability for their sinful behavior by deflection and changing the subject. That's what Israel was doing here when they said, my God, we know you. We're your people. That wasn't the issue. God brought up the fact that they rejected his covenant and they rebelled against his law. They deflected that and went back to the beginning of their relationship with God as a nation and said, God, we know you. We're your people. How can you say? So what does this mean? What does Israel's response to God and Adam's response teach us? It teaches us that there are always two perspectives. And what are those two perspectives? God's perspective, God's outlook, His view, and man's perspective. Right? Everything that we take in eye gate and take in through ear gate, we, add, we either respond to it, it could be as small a response as defining and what we're taking in, we always have a response to what we experience and perceive in reality, either from God's perspective or from our own sinful carnal perspective. Israel did not have God's perspective on their situation guiding them, interpreting their situation for them. And so they had the wrong response to God when, when God said, you've rebelled against me, you've broken the covenant, you've rejected the law. And because they did not have God's perspective on their situation, they had the wrong response. They prevaricated. They changed the subject, did not address the issue that God brought up, and they went back to the beginning of their relationship with God, brought up something else. Now let's get into this. And, and verse 2, this very phrase, defines, really, much of what God says to Israel in the book of Hosea. And they're experiencing God's judgment because they persisted in maintaining this spiritual blindness, this bad perspective for long periods of time which sunk them deeper and deeper into God's judgment. And we do the same thing every day. And that's one of the reasons why individually we're not blessed. We're not blessed. And God's blessing upon us is stifled and limited and greatly restricted. It's in a holding pattern until we put God's perspective back on again. Let's get into this a little bit further. Like I said, God's perspective or God's outlook and view on things is very important. This is a synonym for God's perspective of truth. And I've defined for you before the definition of truth which is to see as God sees. If you and I saw reality according to God's truth, we would have God's perspective on everything. And the Bible says Christians are supposed to be able to see to the root of every matter because we have the mind of Christ. We're, we're given the gift, the miraculous gift, to interpret everything, good and evil, the way God sees it or according to truth. What a precious gift that is. That you are able to see the core of, to, of, of every matter, whether it be a problem, a relational issue that you may be having with someone, a sin, or a choice you need to make, a decision you need to make, 
You are given God's wisdom, his perspective, his mind, so that you can see through to the dynamics and the active components that you should use, the factors that you should use, the spiritual factors that you should use to make every single decision that will always result in you making the right decision. The right decision. The right decision being the decision God wants you to make according to His Word. Now some of those decisions that you make, even when they're the right ones, will cause you pain. Some decisions we'll make is to submit under the persecuting wrath of the lost. Well, that, that's the right decision to make. That's God's perspective. Sometimes He calls for us to suffer. But that's, that's God's perspective on the matter, and that's the perspective we ought to have, and in response we ought to be submissive and surrender to that persecution, right? The second one is man's perspective. That is, as opposed to God's perspective, man's view of reality is limited and finite and tainted by sin. Man's perspective is self-centered, self-aggrandizing, and one-dimensional. But God provides by way of the Holy Spirit these great spiritual gifts which enhance our spiritual sight so we can have all the multi-dimensional factors we need to have to make every time the exact divine decision God wants us to make to glorify Him in our life and to benefit ourselves as well for His purposes. Amen? Most of the time we go off half-cocked, knee-jerk, making decisions in a carnal frame of mind with a pure, selfish, man-centered perspective on things. We hurry through those decisions and we suffer the consequences of those bad decisions that, that won't be reversed. Those decisions won't be reversed for many years sometimes. And this is what happened with Israel. The majority of all failures, listen, the majority, and I'm talking about vast majority, 99% or 95% plus, of all disappointments, all depression. Some, do you have disappointments? Do you get depressed? Do you have failures? All wrong decisions, the majority of all bad choices and mistakes, the majority of your frustration that you and I experience sometimes many times a day is simply due to perceiving reality through man's perspective instead of God's perspective. If you perceive reality through God's perspective, when things come up, come up that would initially tempt you to be frustrated, you, the, the wisdom of God would kick in so you would surrender and submit to such a decision with His peace and contentment thrown in so that not only can you live with such a decision that would grate against your flesh, and a man-centered view of things, but you happily surrender to such a decision that God would have you make. Now, there's biblical theology that undergirds this te that teaching that's greatly expanded in the New Testament. I want you to turn to James chapter 1. I don't want to throw these things out and have you assume I'm right. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now we find in James chapter 1 a wonderful promise of God to his people that he will give us wisdom if we need it. So we have many choices and sometimes our choices and decisions are not easy ones. We scratch our heads and we say, wait a minute, 
What do I do in this situation, right? And so we need to get wisdom from a reliable source. And God promises that if we ask in prayer, He will give us that wisdom. He may choose a source of that wisdom through many ways, the counsel of uh, wise and godly people, uh, a, a book or the Bible itself, or of course through prayer and providence, God leads us to make godly choices and get His perspective on matters so that we're not schizophrenic. But I want you to notice something that's going on underneath the surface here. In James 1, 5 through 8, we have depicted a person who is double-minded, who's being tossed back and forth, who is greatly conflicted about making choices. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea. So we have this metaphor of a wave being tossed to and fro. Can't make a decision. What should I do? I don't want to dishonor God in this decision. And so we see then that we really need to have God's perspective on things. And we need to maintain His perspective and receive His wisdom on a daily basis or every day where in some decisions we're going to be tossed to and fro. We're going to be frustrated. We're going to have to delay some decisions that should be made sooner or we're going to be making the wrong decisions if we don't have God's perspective on things. We don't have His wisdom. So getting this wisdom is very important because all of us make hundreds of decisions every day from which toothpaste to use to major life-changing decisions. I'm not talking about those choices that are free agency within the realm of free agency where we choose to use Crest toothpaste as opposed to Tom's of Maine, which I use because I'm more holistic in my choices <laughs> in, in those things. What I'm talking about are important decisions, how I talk to people, how I relate to people, which I do hundreds of times a day, unless I'm in a jail cell and I have nobody in there to talk to. Or choices about what things I spend God's money on, and so on. So getting God's perspective is very important, and biblical theology guides us. James 1 says, get God's wisdom, don't be tossed to and fro. Why? Because who is the source of all wisdom? God is. And a lack of God's perspective causes double-mindedness and instability leading to wrong decisions. Next is James chapter 3. I have three texts I want to show you. The second is James 3 verse 13. Again talking about a person who is wise, a person who has God's perspective, God's outlook, God's truth guiding them through every moment of the day. James 3, beginning at verse 13 through 17. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I want you to notice the connection between God's wisdom or God's perspective. What is God's wisdom? except simply God's perspective on everything. What is truth except simply God's perspective on everything? Notice the difference or the connection between God's perspective and godly behavior and good choices. Backing up in James 3, if you look at the person who is wise and understanding, the one who has God's perspective, I want you to see at the end of verse 14, it says, do not boast and lie against the truth. So the person who does not have God's perspective is not walking in the truth. Their life chafes against the truth. Their life 
resists and goes contrary to God's perspective and outlook in their choices. You following me on this? This is very important. And so whenever we have God's perspective in things, this text teaches us that our choices or our behavior will always affirm that we have God's perspective. The good choices we make, our actions and behavior will always be in harmony with God's perspective on everything. And so the wise, God-oriented person who has God's perspective will never have bitter envy or will never be selfish or self-seeking in their hearts. So, we should ask ourselves, if I have God's perspective upon an issue, a problem, a choice, a decision to make, is that decision, is this perspective rooted in anything selfish? Who's getting something out of this? Is God getting something out of it? Is He glorified? Or am I getting something out of it? Is selfishness driving this decision or is the glory of God driving it? Because if my perspective is God-centered, there won't be any self-seeking or bitter envy, and there won't be any subtle, seducing lie that is trying to convince me to make a decision that does not keep God's glory in mind. For where envy, watch, verse 16, and what self-seeking exists, including our decisions, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, God's perspective, God's truth, God's wisdom, always is manifested by purity, peace, gentleness, willing to yield, which is humility, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So we see a very close connection between wisdom or God's perspective and godly behavior. Now let's transfer this principle back to Hosea chapter 8. And when God says to Israel, you've broken the covenant, you've rebelled against my law. We see that they did not have God's perspective on their situation, which shows us their heart was bad. Because if their hearts were pure, if their conscience were clear, if they were true Christians, born again by the Spirit of God, where the Holy Spirit and the Word of God dominated their thinking and their decisions and their worldview, they would have submitted to God, repented of their sin, and they would have loved God's law as a result, and they would have obeyed the covenant. So there's a close connection between God's perspective and obedience and the fruits of the Spirit that follow. So if, you're, if, there, if your conscience is bothering you, usually, not always, it's a good guide that you don't have God's perspective on the situation fully in making a particular decision or in a conversation with someone. It's better to back off, be silent, and run as fast as you can to a quiet place and repent or ask God to search your heart and try you to see if there's any wicked way in you. Get God's perspective on it again and you won't feel restless or nervous or have conscience problems. He will give you the grace to make godly choices rooted in holiness because you'll be given humility to not fight not resist, not be hostile. God's grace will give you strength to pull back the reins to submit to the Lord. How do we know this? Let me give you some examples. We know that Adam, for example, and Israel did not have good good uh, God's perspective, and they did not submit. They had no humility. They didn't repent. The same thing is true with Cain. Cain offered the wrong offering. 
And God tried to help him and give him the divine perspective of things. And all Cain did was argue with him. He had the wrong answer because Cain was selfish. He had a man-centered, carnal perspective on things. I want to give you two examples of, of people who do something bad, but they respond with the right perspective. For example, David, when he committed uh, adultery and murder, his sin ultimately, after a year or two or more, was found out. God sent Nathan the prophet to confront David and hold him accountable. And when Nathan the prophet, God's instrument at that moment, said to David, Thou art the man. You're the murderer. David being full of blindness, he had lost temporarily God's perspective. And believers can go for a long time without having the blessed, pure, guiding perspective from above helping us make godly decisions. But David had enough of God's perspective and grace so that when his temporary blindness was removed by the Lord and he was able to see as God sees, he didn't argue with God. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. He submitted, he repented, and God immediately said, your sin is forgiven. No argument. Why? Because he had the right perspective and he was able to respond properly. Same thing is true with Job. You read the book of Job from chapter 2 to chapter 40. Job is full of words. Full of words. A 40 chapter response. Wow, that's a lot of words, Job. He's arguing with the friends. He's arguing with this guy, that guy, the other guy. Complaining and this and that. But when in one short conversation, God grants Job fresh grace to regather his divine perspective. Job doesn't talk a lot. He says, I have heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. I repent in dust and ashes. I put my hand over my mouth and speak no more. He had the right response. He had, why? Because he had God's perspective. Bring this back to Israel again. Israel said, but Lord, we know you. Really? Really? Do they know? They don't know God. Otherwise, they would not be dismissing the issue at hand, prevaricating at with and changing the topic. So, my point is that we need God's perspective, and we know we have God's perspective when our behavior is godly, when our hearts are rendered quiet in submission to Him, and we are happy with the choice, even if it means deprivation, and pain, we are happy with that choice because we know we are in the will of God and we have God's perspective on the matter. Amen? Amen. All right, the, the last text is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but you know what? I'm going to stop and have a part two. I'm at 45 minutes right now. So you're going to have a 45 minute sermon today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and praise you for the wisdom that comes from above that is pure and peaceable and gentle. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit, the anointing which we have received from the Holy One, would show us all things. Because you told us that, that we are your children and we know all things because of this anointing. Lord, that you would search our hearts and see if there is indeed any wrong way, any sinful behavior that we have not repented of. But that we would come to Christ today. The one who gives us his outlook, his worldview, so that we can see ourselves as you see us and walk with you in the truth. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would cleanse us all afresh in your precious blood that cries mercy, that pleads for our cleansing and our restoration. We thank you for your death on the cross, the shed blood that you offered for our sanctification so that we can continually abide with you and walk with you and commune with you, though we sin every day.
and may not only maintain our divine and heavenly perspective on reality, but also love you as we should and have our worship accepted in the Beloved. Lord, we pray that we would walk with you in wisdom and that we would not be schizophrenic. We would not be double-minded. We would not have a carnal mind and your perspective, but we would just walk with you and see everything as you see it and make decisions accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.